gospel lesson, as many gospel lessons during the season of Advent, comes from the time before our Lord's passion. This comes from the final discourse in John, the 16th chapter. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but will tell you plainly of the Father. On that day you will ask in my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. His disciples said, yes, now you're speaking plainly, not in any figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need to have anyone question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that you may have peace in the world you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, it's Peace Sunday, right? Let me tell you a little bit about my day. It has not been peaceful. It started yesterday because uh, I'm having guests for dinner. I may have to cancel them. I was making a cheesecake, a little bit of ambitious for a Saturday for a preacher, let me tell you that. And as I put the bowl, the, after dumping the chocolate cheesecake batter in, to turn for the peppermint cheesecake batter to go on top, I knocked the bowl onto the floor. It exploded into 10,000 pieces. My dog decided that chocolate-covered glass was a good thing to eat. So I was trying to fight her off, and I was trying to sweep up all this broken glass with chocolate in it, and I got up as much as I could. I was up till about 1 o'clock doing that this morning. Then I got up this morning, and with the light coming in the windows, I saw all the glass that I'd missed, which was now fused with chocolate to the floor, glistening, and ants had come in to eat it. Peace, huh? <laughs> Not feeling very peaceful this morning, I tell you that. But I want to give you your Bible quiz du jour. Name passages for me about peace in Scripture. You could look in the book if you needed to, but you know these passages. A passage about peace. Do I have to call in Reverend Smiley out there to answer for us? Come on, you know scripture better than that. What was that? Blessed are the peacemakers. Good for you, you saw the bulletin, didn't you? Anybody heard that one before? Blessed are the peacemakers, we have another one. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That's a great one. Anybody else have one? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. You got that? That's coming up, right? Anybody have another one? There are 340 mentions of peace. We've got three so far. <laughs> The peace that passes all understanding. You're cooking with gas now up here, Linda. <laughs> peace. What a concept, huh? Peace. When we talk about peace in our world today, what do we think of? We think of the absence of warfare. But we're talking about shalom here, God's shalom, which is different. God's shalom is very much all-encompassing, as Tom read to you this morning. It's more than just the absence of strife Shalom is the fullness of God, the abundance of God, the fulfillment of God's purposes in people. It has to do with prosperity. It has to do with justice. It has to do with that overflowing, abundant life that God gives us. And while peace itself, or shalom, is a noun, what are we called to be? Peacemakers. Blessed are the shalom makers, which means we have to put it into action. These are not the lectionary passages for today, although, as I said, reading from the final discourse of Jesus is very appropriate during the season of Advent, which, very much like the season of Lent, is the season of penitence. It's a time of thinking deeply about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and what response that calls forth from us. Now, if you know any passage at all from the prophet Micah, a minor prophet of Israel, you know the one we read. 
You, O Bethlehem, tiny little backwater Bethlehem, about as far from Jerusalem as Cockeysville is from Baltimore City, actually. That's how close they were, but different in their makeup because in those days, that little distance was a great distance to travel. What does it say that this one is going to do, the one born there? He is going to feed his flock in the strength of the Lord. They shall live secure, for he will be great to the ends of the earth, and he will be the one of peace. He will be the one of shalom. Shalom being living in security. And the one that we read from John's Gospel, Jesus saying to them, I have said this to you so that you may have shalom. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I've conquered the world. Strange words coming from a Lord who is about to be killed the next day, nailed to the cross, but this is John's gospel. The one where Jesus' last word from the cross is, it is finished. Not as it's finished, it's over with. It is accomplished, God's plan and God's purpose. Peace, he says to them. The world, you will have persecution but you may have peace in me. Take courage, I've overcome the world. As we come to communion this morning, I've told you before how moving this is for me. I yearn for the day when I get to hand you real bread and you get to dip it in the cup and we get to share again in that way. But until then, we have these lovely little cups with that little wafer that tastes nothing like bread. But it still brings us together in Jesus Christ. It moves me so much that the night before he died, he is not thinking of himself and his needs, although he prays in the garden, let this cup pass from me if possible, but not my will, but yours. But as he gathers with them, he says, one of you is going to betray me, one of you is going to deny me, the rest of you are going to desert me, which is what he says here. Now you believe. The hour is coming, indeed it is coming, you'll be scattered, each one, and you will leave me alone. And yet what does he do? He says to them, here is my body, here is my blood given for you. That's why I can come to the table. I don't come on my own merit. I come on my knees. If they were better, literally, but figuratively on my knees because Christ has come to me in such a powerful way, in humility, in the frailty of a human infant, growing up like our kids up here this morning, growing to adulthood, loving and forgiving and serving and leading people to God and embodying God's kingdom because he brought it on earth. And then he, before that day, took them up the mountain and sat down and said, blessed are you when people persecute you. And he said, blessed are the peacemakers, the makers of shalom, for they will be called children of God. This kind of shalom, this fullness of God, cannot be contained in one human heart. It has to spill out. It has to spill over. It has to touch everyone we meet. We have to take it from being that noun of shalom to that action of making peace. And how do we do that? We look to the letter of Paul to the Roman church, the 12th chapter. This passage will always be important to me because I got to read this passage. I got to present it in American Sign Language at my own ordination. So it's one of those passages that I really wrestled with to understand the depth of its meaning. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. No one here, I doubt, has been persecuted. No one born in America, anyway, has been persecuted for our faith. We've had our toes stepped on, but we don't know what real persecution is. But when people hurt us, when people stab us in the back or gossip about us or break our hearts, we're called to bless them and not curse them. We're called to rejoice when others are rejoicing and to weep with those who are brokenhearted. We're called to live in harmony, not to be haughty, but to associate with the lowly and not to claim to be wiser than we are. And isn't this one one of the great commandments? Do not pay anyone, repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Do you ever think you'd miss the passing of the peace in church? That's one that people have fussed at me over. I don't know, Mark, did people fuss at you about the passing of the peace? Nobody wants to pass the peace. I don't know what that is. Some people say, we don't want to do it because it disrupts worship. It is worship. It is worship. The handshake, you know where that was invented? It was to extend your hand to show someone that you had no weapon. And sometimes people will turn to their spouse and say, peace be with you. Yeah, back at you. 
but there are people who take it very seriously, who will go to someone, maybe someone they haven't spoken to in years. A woman did this once in one of my congregations. She took it seriously, and she went to someone who had not spoken to her in years and said, the peace of Christ to you. Looked at her and went, huh. So the next time communion rolled around, she went back and said, the peace of Christ to you. And they went, hmm, hmm. The next month, they took her hand. The month after that, it was the peace of Christ with you and also with you. Because that is making shalom. Meeting people's needs is making shalom. Feeding the hungry is making shalom. Living before God in righteousness is living shalom and making shalom. Understanding that all that we have and ever hope to be comes from God's loving hand is making shalom when we share that with the world. Some of us are reading the book Hidden Christmas, and it's, it stings a little bit, doesn't it, Carolyn? Oh. Yeah, we're, we read chapter 4, and we all felt like gone into hiding for a while. But the author says to us, it's not enough to be in a church full of people who look like us, act like us, dress like us. We have to take the church into the world. We have to go where people are hurting and bleeding who may be different than us. We have to go where they're sad and brokenhearted. We have to go where they're hungry and filthy, dirty, and nothing at all like us. We have to go where they don't even speak the same language as us and share Christ with them, and then we will be making shalom, and then we will be blessed, and then we will be called children of the Most High God. I told you that my last 18 hours have not been filled with peace. And if you look at the world today, you might say the peace is in very short supply. Do you ever think you'd get to the point where political parties would be the dividing line between people to the point that if someone disagrees with you, you have nothing left in common with them but to hurl insults at each other? Did you think that things could get that bad? But let me tell you, they can get better. Not through our agency, not through our actions, not through our works or even our words, but by letting Christ fill us till we overflow with the abundance of God. Then we will have the courage to say, I may disagree with you, but I love you. Then we may see things change. That's why peace follows hope, because they go hand in hand. If we stop hoping for peace, which is very much a verb, if we start making shalom, the world will change, even just around us, even in our own families. So this morning, I hope when you come to the table, we're not going to literally come now, and we can't literally share the peace of Christ with each other. But I hope you will wish those around you and pray in your own heart for the peace of God that passes all understanding so that we might live God's shalom and embody God's kingdom. And remember, Jesus saying, I know you're going to betray me, Terry. I know you've denied me sometimes by your actions, and I know you've deserted me sometimes in your decisions. But this is my body and blood given for you. Given for you. So go out into the world and make some shalom in the name of the one who is the Prince of Shalom. Amen and amen.